Our God is great and glorious. We put our trust in your name, Jesus. Able to save and deliver us. We put our hope in your name, Jesus. Everybody say, blessing and honor.
Seeking a place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones And I tried with all my might But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond And just when I
better than Abraham, better than Moses, David, and Mary. He's better than the angels, better than the demons, better than any prophet, priest, or saint. From beginning to end, this book has one beautiful story and one unified theme. The Bible is clear. Jesus is better. But there will be times when it's hard to believe. Times when it doesn't feel like Jesus is better. The world will reject you, your flesh will fight you, and the devil will lie to you. Storms will come. You're going to face disappointment, deception, betrayal, and rejection. You're going to feel tired, empty, brokenhearted, scared, and alone. But don't forget in the darkness what you learned in the light. Jesus is better. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Prince of peace and the light of the world. He's the friend of sinners and the enemy of Satan. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is better. And if you really truly believe it, it's going to cost you. You're going to help the poor, defend the powerless, swallow your pride and love your enemies. You're going to study the scriptures when you'd rather scroll your phone. You're going to pray when you'd rather sleep. You're going to serve when you'd rather be served. And you're going to speak up when you'd rather be silent. But when it's all said and done, you won't regret it. You'll say, it was worth it. Jesus is better. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. In other words, Jesus is better. Thirteen letters, three words, one sentence, and no question about it. Jesus is better. Hey everybody, good morning, great morning, better yet, best of all, as I customarily say here at Insight Church, God morning to you. Welcome back to Insight Church Online to Insight Church at home or Insight Church wherever you are. Such an honor to be with you. It's still early enough in the year for me to wish you a happy new year. And better than happy new year, I would say a blessed new year, a prosperous new year, a new year that is marked by the divine favor and goodness of God, the faithfulness of God. It's so much better than just happy new year. You know why? Because the goodness of God, the favor, the blessing of God, friends, it will indeed make you happy. Folks, that is what we're praying for and believing uh, with you and your family to transpire this particular year, uh, to be a year like no other in your life. Be encouraged. So grateful for you. We are honored to walk with you and to do life with you. Thanks for being part of the Insight Church tribe. You know, as much as we enjoy our online services, if you are relatively close to our uh, geographical campuses, friends, geographically close, close, I should say, to our in-person services, we want to invite you out to our Tinley campus and our Skokie campus to join us in person at 10 o'clock a.m. every Sunday. You may know family members or friends or co-workers or college buddies that live near our church, folks. I'm telling you, we are having the most amazing time here at, at Insight Church, friends, listening to the testimony, friends, just uh, listening to the heart of our members uh, from our in-person services, sharing how much our church means to them, how vital it is to have a place to plug in, a place of belonging, friends, a place to be planted. Uh, we're so grateful for what God is doing. And we know as a church, this is going to be a remarkable year for us in person and online. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and for being part. You know, I want to encourage you to engage beginning tomorrow on Monday, January 9th, we're beginning a week of 24 seven corporate prayer and fasting, a week of consecrating ourselves to the Lord as a church. We have a 24 uh, seven uh, prayer clock. Friends, folks are going to be praying around the clock for you, for us, for our church, with our church. And we want you to get engaged and be involved and join us this week. Setting yourself apart, fasting, not Jesus says not if you fast, but when you fast, it's a spiritual discipline, a very powerful spiritual weapon that God has given us, friends, to uh, let's just say to consecrate ourselves and sanctify ourselves uh, to be set apart to him for the Lord to do some remarkable things in us and through us that cannot accomplish 
be accomplished without the discipline of fasting. Remember, Jesus says this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Friends, there are some breakthroughs that only come when you give yourself to prayer and you give yourself to fasting. So join us this week. Know you're going to be blessed to know it's going to be a life changing time for you and your family as well. One other note I want to uh, remind you of, friends, is, is our invitation for you to come to Israel with us. This is the year I already can't wait until September 4th when we uh, uh, have our next tour, friends, really our third tour uh, to Israel, to the Holy Land. It's always an amazing uh, trip. My heart is longing uh, to be there right now. And I know that you will enjoy being in the Holy Land and your life will be changed. I encourage every believer, certainly every person associated with Insight Church to plan at some point to come to Israel with us. And I believe that this is the year to do so while there is space left. Hope you can join us. Well, before we move forward with the word of God, this is our time to invest in the ministry that God has given all of us. Thanks for being a participant, friends. Uh, you know, we, we're just amazed at what we can do as a church when we all do a little, when we all do our part. You know, Ephesians chapter four, uh, Paul writes about each part doing its share, what every joint supplies, every part doing its share. It causes growth of the body, folks. Our church gets stronger, more impactful, more effective when we each do our part. When we each bring our share, friends, it causes our church to grow. It causes the kingdom of God to move forward and advance through Insight Church because of your your vision, uh, your your involvement and your investment in our vision, friends. What is my part? What is my share? Among other things, my part and my share is my tithe, my offering, friends. And God can do some amazing things when each of us does our part and we bring our share, friends. This is that time for us to do so. Thanks for being a partner. Thanks for being all in here at Insight Church, friends. We've been uh, studying the word of God. I'm going to talk about it in the, in the teaching today, friends, what it means to honor the Lord with the first fruits of your increase, friends. When you honor God, God will honor you. He cannot avoid and will not withhold his honor from the lives of people that honor him. This is one of the ways that we do so in the area of giving tithes and offerings. Friends, scan the QR code you see there, text to the number on the screen, uh, use your church app, mail your support, visit our website at insightchurch.org anytime, friends. This is our opportunity to give to God through our local church to honor him and to worship him. Watch him do some great things in your life. Thanks for being involved and being a supporter, being a partner, friends, and now, you are about to hear the word of God, friends. I always say this is the time to declare that your heart is good ground, good soil for the good seed of God's word. It's the seed of God's word. Friends, your faith, the quality of your heart that determines the productivity of the seed of God's word in your life, friends. Now is the time to do so. It's going to be a life changing mind renewing faith building time in God's word as I teach on first things first. Friends, I'm going to go ahead and leak it. I'm going to talk to you today about being God's firstborn. I'm going to talk to you about your first love for Jesus Christ and the importance of you bringing first fruits to the Lord at the beginning of the year. It's going to change your year in ways that you can't even imagine. Open your heart. Get ready to receive. Take a listen at this. Time for you to declare your heart to be good ground for the seed of God's word because it's the quality of the soil of your heart that determines the productivity of the seed of God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. Oh, how we love your law. It is our meditation all the day. And you, through your commandments, you make us wiser than our enemies. We ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that the entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. We ask you, Father, to open the eyes of our understanding that we may comprehend the scriptures. Holy Spirit, we honor you this morning, our teacher, our helper, our parakletos, the one who gives us the advantage in this life, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see and does not know, but we see you and we know you because you're not only with us, but you're in us. And we ask you this morning to increasingly form within us the character of our Lord Jesus Christ and to bring about the reality of his kingdom 
in our lives and through our lives to the world around us. In Jesus' name, everybody agree and wholeheartedly said? Okay, well, let's get to work here. I want to teach today. We're still continuing with this forward theme. If I had to give you one word of what we prayerfully believe, the Lord has been speaking into our hearts and speaking uh, over our church this year is one word. It's forward. Everybody shout forward. forward. That's God's word for us. It's God's word for you and your family is moving forward. And we're going to continue that. And in the interest of us moving forward, um, on this first day, I'll talk about this of the new year. I want to talk to you about first things first. It's the first day, the new year. We need to talk about first things first. And um, I know that this is the right word at the right time for the right people. So open your heart and get ready to receive it because I believe it's going to be, as always, life-changing, mind-renewing. It's going to be faith-building, something that will set the tone for the remainder of your year will be set today. That whatever we set in place spiritually today will define the rest of your year for all of us. And so I want to encourage you to open your heart to receive an impartation from the Spirit of God and from the Word of God. So on this first day of the week, of course, right, which is Sunday, in this first month of January, and on this first day of the new year of 2023, I want to briefly teach on really setting your life in order with right priorities. And we're going to talk about first things first. Setting our lives in right priority, first things first. And in doing so, we're going to see uh, what you can describe as the laws of first that are mentioned in the scriptures. There are some things that the Bible is very explicit about talking about what's first and what has to come first. We're going to take a look at that. Now, let's start here. We're just going to lay some foundation. Number one, we got to see that God is a God of order. When we talk about setting our lives in order, first things first, God is a God of order. Let's jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. I'm going to move pretty quickly here because we've got a lot of ground to cover. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40 says this, let all things be done what? And how? Let all things be done decently and in order. That word order is a Greek word that that is uh, taxes. It it also means that everything be done in right sequence. Let everything be done in right sequence. That's very important. Decently in order or things done in right sequence or right succession. The the, the right order. Things happening after previous things the way that they they should. Let's start with Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Talking about order. All things being done decent and in order. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 tells us after creation that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. In other words, the the world was completely out of order. There was chaos during that time. Immediately after God began to create, it says the earth was without form, void, darkness on the face of the deep, out of order, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. So what you see as you continue to read through Genesis chapter 1 is that the universe was in chaos and the very first thing the Spirit of God began to do was to set things in order. He began to struck. There was chaos. The earth was void. And it's interesting, from the very beginning, the Spirit of God was there to turn that chaotic situation, to bring it into order to fulfill the divine purposes of God. Are you with me? Come on. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to put things in order. Let's think think about it not just in theologically terms, theological terms. You know the term sin, harmartia means to miss the mark, right? Sin, Sin is just having a life that's disorderly. A life that's not aligned with the word of God. A life that's not aligned with the purposes and the will of God. The Holy Spirit comes practically to bring your life back in order, to drive out the chaos and to bring order, or what we call righteousness. Are you with me? Very, very important. So that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's It's his job. And even in that time of creation, I mean, all the natural laws of physics and magnetism and, you know, all the scientific truths that we've discovered... All of those things were present. The law law of gravity, it was all present there. The Lord began to set all of creation in order. 
It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That same Holy Spirit that you and I have been baptized with that resides on the inside of us, his ministry is to put your life in order. Very important. Somebody say amen. Come on, let's keep going here. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He puts things in order. He does things decently and in order. He's not the author of confusion. This is a year, no more confusion. No more confusion in your mind. No more confusion in your family. No more confusion about what direction you're going on and, and what job you should take and confused about politics. No more confusion because God is not the author of confusion. It's a year for divine order here. Can you say amen? In the mighty name of Jesus. That same verse of scripture, 1 Corinthians 14, 33 from the New Living Translation says very plainly, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace as in all the meetings of God's people. He wants to put our lives in order. Order always initiates the blessing of God. You remember when Jesus was just before he, um, I'm thinking about him just before he multiplied the fish and the loaves. You remember he gave his disciples orders, instructions, put everybody in order. Get, get groups of 50, set everybody down in an orderly fashion before the miracle to, could take place. He says, put everything in order. Order always precedes the blessing of God. It always precedes the miracle working power of God. Things have to be put in order because God is not a God of confusion. Somebody say amen. That means to become a better steward even of what we have. Put things in order. We believe in God for an increase this year. You know what? We got we to gotta put some things in order financially. We got to set some right priorities. If we want to put some relationships in order, see God do some great things. Everything needs to be set in order because God cannot bless and prosper a disorderly life. It's inconsistent with his nature. Take a look at this. I've, I've seen this for years. You can be sincerely devotional on Sunday and be highly dysfunctional on Monday. I'm telling you, it can, we can be highly devotional, sincerely devotional today. Lord Jesus, we worship you with all of our hearts and Monday morning be highly dysfunctional on, on Monday. Why? Because the love of God does not rearrange a disorderly life. The wisdom of God does that. The wisdom of God. So it's not just being devotional and continuing to be dysfunctional. Not just the love of God, but the wisdom of God and orderly life begins with putting God first in everything that we do. I'm talking about us preparing for God to do greater and to do more in our lives. It begins by putting some things in, in order. Just go ahead and do yourself and your family and your future a favor and get things in order. Get things in order. Not just the love of God, but the wisdom of God to put some things in order. There's no alternative. There's no other option than for us to set things in proper order. Now, we're talking about first, first things first. Let's look at some prophetic picture, a prophetic picture here of the significance of first. Everybody say first. first. Very important word in the scriptures and the purposes of God. We're going to see that. So let's take a look at what I call a prophetic picture of the significance of first. The Old Testament talks a whole lot about offering sacrificial lambs without blemish, watch this, in their first year of life on the first day of the first month of the first year. Sometimes you're reading through the Old, scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, you're reading through the Pentateuch, there's lots of, lots of instruction about an animal in its first year without blemish, sacrifice it on the first day of the first month of the first year. Why not the second day or the third day? God was very specific in communicating the importance of first, and it was to be, it was to be blameless. It was to be an, an animal without, without blemish. Take a look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. Very interesting here. And it came to pass after, this is during the days of the flood, flood of Noah, after the flood of Noah's day, Genesis 8, 13, and it came to pass in the 601st year, listen to this, in the first month, the first day of the month. In other words, 
it was New Year's Day. It was New Year's Day, the 601st year, but it was the first month, the first day of the month. It was a day like today. It was New Year's. Now watch what happens. It says on that day, on that New Year's Day, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. Come on, a, a, a prophetic picture of something that happened on a New Year's Day in the 601st year. Very important. The word of God says that the waters were dried up from the earth and says that the surface was dry. Why is that significant on that New Year's Day? It's very simple. The waters represented the flood of God's judgment. Right? The waters represented God's judgment. And somehow, some way, on a New Year's Day, Noah looks outside the ark and the water was receded and he saw dry ground. Yes. Which, which means that the curse was lifted. Are you with me? Yes. Why, why not the second day, the third day? He looked out on this particularly New Year's Day. And that dry ground meant that the judgment was receded and it meant that the curse was lifted. It happened on a New Year's, on New Year's Day. You, you think about other pictures of, of dry ground in scriptures. In the scriptures, you think of um, the children of Israel crossing through the Red Sea on what? Dry ground, right? You see the same thing in Joshua. Joshua standing with the priest, them carrying the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the River Jordan. The, Vi the Bible is very clear in saying that they, the priest stood on dry ground and the people walked over on dry ground. Isn't God awesome? Come on, not, not, not muddy ground. I don't, I don't know about you. After a good rain, you know how long it takes for the, dry, for the ground to dry up? But in an instant, somehow God extracts all the water and the people moved over on dry ground. You know, you know why dry ground is so important? You can't get any traction in the mud. Your wheels will keep on spinning. You keep slipping and falling. But when you're walking on dry ground, you can get traction and you can move. And for God to, to pay attention to detail, he always makes sure that his people moves on dry ground. And Noah could see that the curse was being lifted. It's Psalm 40. As a matter of fact, that David prayed, he says, Lord, you, you took me out of a hor horrible pit. You pulled me out of the miry clay. He took me out of the mud and set my foot upon a rock. He established my ways. He established my going. You see a picture of God always putting his people on firm ground, on dry ground. That's why we sing Christ is our Firm foundation. Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. It was a prophetic picture on that New Year's Day that he saw dry ground. And I'm speaking and declaring in the name and the authority of the Lord Jesus, this is the year for us to move on dry ground. Amen. Dry ground. We're going to get traction. We're not going to spin any wheels anymore. We're not going to be slipping and sliding. And Come on. We're going to move forward on dry ground this year. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of the Lord. You see this theme all throughout Scripture. The past few years have been muddy. They've been messy. Slipping and sliding all over the place. The Lord wants us to walk on dry ground. And the curse has been lifted. Somebody say amen. amen. In the name of Jesus. So scripturally, it always seems that whenever you read about a first day and a first month and, a, and the first year and a new year, it always represents a a reset or a restart for God's people. That's the significance of first. First always announces a reset and a restart. It's the significance of things happening first in our lives. Every single morning, God's mercies are what? Yeah. New every day. This, he's always communicating restart, a reboot with something new. It's the significance of first. First matters in the kingdom of God because everything that comes after whatever is first is subordinate. 
whatever happens first is, is very, very significant, you know? If you, um, let's just say if you, if you uh, bake cakes, if your, maybe your 25th cake <laughs> will be better than your first cake. Not because 25 is better than one. You didn't know what you were doing the first time. So you needed practice by what we call trial and error. So your 25th cake would be better than your first cake because we didn't know what we were doing. We had to try to get the recipe right, we had to get the measurements right, the oven was too hot, all that kind of stuff, trial and error. Listen, when God does something, he gets it right the first time every time. Every single time. And you know what? I don't, I don't need to practice on my 10th marriage to figure out how it works. He gets it right the first time when God is in it. Are you, I'm telling you, when God is in it, he always gets it right, and he does things right the first time. He's a God of first. If, if God, you know, played golf, I like to say, if God was a golfer, I think, I think par is what, 72? So you play 18 holes of golf, then from a human standpoint, if you shoot 72, if you have 72 strokes, that's pretty much a perfect round of golf. You par 72, you swung the club 72 times, and you, you pretty much mastered the course. 72 strokes. Well, if God, played a, if God played golf, his score would always be 18. <laughs> Are you understand what I'm saying? If he, there are 18 holes. If God played golf, his, his, his perfection wouldn't be 72. His score would always be 18 because every time he swings the club, hole in one. <laughs> hole in one. Every time he swings the club. I'm, I'm telling you about, about the God of, of order. I'm talking about God's perfection operative in our lives. It's a different mindset. Somebody say amen. amen. The law of first mention. And biblical interpretation. These things are important in terms of what the, what the scriptures has to say in terms of what God established when he mentioned something the first time. You know, let's, I mean, marriage is a great example. When God first mentioned marriage, it's real simple. Adam and Eve. What's so hard about that? How do we go from that to the LGBTQIA2S plus it was real simple. When he first mentioned the institution, it was just Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Steve and Genevieve and Louise. It was, it was just, it was just, it was just what God mentioned. All of society is moving away from God's divine order and what he established first. This is why this is so important and so critical in our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. Sin happened. By Genesis chapter 4, you see Lamech, who was the son of Noah. The Bible says he took for himself two wives. Then all of a sudden, the folks start making up stuff and doing things according to their, their own wisdom. This is what we're seeing in society today. After God defines first, what gives people the right to go back and redefine what God has already established? That is the epitome of arrogance and pride when we go back to redefine something that God established as being first. And this is, the, this is the fight for our generation, is to return what it is that God first established that represents our commitment and our integrity to the truth of God's word. Can you say amen? amen. So we see out through the word of God that God himself is first. Just laying some foundation here. Genesis 1, God is the first. So we just read in Genesis chapter 1, Verse 2, if you back up to verse 1, it says, in the beginning what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. First starts right there. Very simple. Most important verse of scripture without doubt in the Bible is Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Because if there was no in the beginning God, nothing else would have come after that. Real first, in the beginning God. Everything starts with, with the person of God. And when God is first, he brings everything into divine order. When God is not first, nothing can come into order. 
When he's first, everything comes in order. In order. When he's not first, nothing else can come in order. Take a look with me at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21. God speaks to this idea that he is first. It says, Isaiah 40, 21, have you not known, have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth that speaks to God's what's called theologically his transcendent nature. God operating outside of creation. So it says very plainly, God sits above beyond the circle of the earth. Look at the next part. And its inhabitants are like what? Isn't that clear? He sits above the circle of the earth. We're all like grasshoppers. And yet we're constantly redefining what the God who sits above the circle of the earth has established as right order and right priority. And here goes the grasshoppers getting together. Brains are not that big coming up with a different idea <laughs> to correct the God that sits above the circle of the earth. Grasshoppers. Supreme Court justices, politicians, preachers, theologians, all grasshoppers. Deciding different and against what was established as first by the God who sits above the circle of the earth. Come on, folks, I'm telling you where we, where we live today. Verse 22 says, it is he who sits again above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Verse 23 says that God brings the princes to nothing. These are rulers. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. <laughs> makes them all useless. Verse 25, chapter 40, verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, God says, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name. That means every rock, every asteroid, every planet, every galaxy, the billions of galaxies that are in the universe, it says God has named every rock, every asteroid has a name given to it by God. He calls them all by their name. Every single one of them has been identified uniquely and given a name by God. And when he determines that something is first, a priority, the grasshoppers get together and vote to call it something different than what God has said. It's amazing. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. He sets them all in order. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 12 says this, God pleased with the people, says, listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first, I also the last. God announces, I'm first. So when we talk about first things first, God is the first. He makes it clear. Not just God, Jesus, who is the word of God, also declares that he's first. Take a look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, John writes here, I fell at his feet as dead. But he, speaking of Jesus, laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Same thing that God quoted. Jesus makes it clear that I am God. And he says, I am the first. Remember John chapter 8, he tells the religious leaders, which really, really got them all sideways. He tells them, before Abraham was, I am. He's, he, he makes it clear, he's, he's the first. So when we talk about first things first, God is the first. Jesus is the first. The one who sits above the circle of the earth. John 1 verse 1, we know this, in the beginning was the word. Everything starts with the word of God, and the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning or first with God. And here's why we stand on the word. Verse three, 
all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. Jesus is the first. He is the word. He was, on the, he was in the beginning with God. He was God and all things were made through the word. You know what that means? That includes homes, careers, investments, things, what you drive, what you eat, what you wear. All things were made through the word and the word was first with God. That's why we start with the scriptures. Because everything else that we think is important and we think is a priority was created and is derived and is sustained by the word. So we always start with the word and we put the word first. The person of the word comes first. Trust me, it will, it will give life to everything else in your life. When you get that order right, I'm telling you, it will supply everything you need in, in, in every other area of your life when we start with right priority. Somebody say amen. amen. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 from the New King James Version. And we'll come back to this passage. It says here, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He may have the preeminence. Same verse of scripture from the Amplified Bible. He also is the head of his body, the church, seeing he is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that he alone in everything and in every respect might occupy the chief place Stand first and be preeminent. It's very explicit concerning the place of priority for Jesus Christ in the lives of God people that he alone in everything in every respect may occupy the chief place. The place of priority in our lives that he would stand first and be preeminent. And we're going to come back to this to see that the, the word begins by telling us here in verse 18. He is also the head of his body who is the church, he is the beginning, seeing that he is the beginning, that because of he, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, occupying the chief place and the church being in Christ, he's invited us to occupy the chief place with him. He's called us to occupy the place of priority with him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You with me this morning? I'm, talk I'm talking about a complete relocation of your life as it is to know that we've been called to stand in the preeminent place with our Lord Jesus Christ, and he is first. He is first. The firstborn over all creation. Can you say amen? amen. We'll come back to that. Look at it. We are called to seek God's kingdom first. Jesus tells us this, to seek the kingdom of God first. Matthew 6, he tells us clearly here, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, order, that's that order we talked about, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And again, all these what? Things. things. Remember, he had just talked to them about you seek after the things that the Gentiles that look for are looking for. Oh, ye of little faith, your heavenly father provides these things for you. He, he, he explains to the people all those things will be added to you when you prioritize and seek first the kingdom of God and God's order. In other words, don't, don't live pursuing the things. Don't live a life defined by trying to get the things. Prioritize and seek first the kingdom. And he says he's going to add all the things to you because your father already knows you need those things. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God. This is a reminder on this first day of the, of a, of the first day of the week. First month, first day of a new year to seek first the kingdom of God. God's going to add everything else that you need. You don't have to go looking for it. It's going to come looking for you because you've made it a priority to seek God first. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen, God always blesses the life that puts him first. He always blesses the life that puts him first. First is the greatest expression of faith and trust in God because you don't know what will come second, if anything at all. 
That's why it's such a great expression of faith and trust when you honor God with the first, because you don't necessarily know the moment you give up the first, you got to trust him for whatever comes next. It expresses our faith. It expresses our trust in God. When they sacrificed the first offspring of the animal, they didn't know if the animal was going to produce anything else. So they had, they had to just trust and believe God that the animal would keep producing, and it always would because faith is the greatest expression. First is the greatest expression of faith and trust in the Lord. Trust me, if you give the commission check, you don't know if you're going to get another check. You know what? But it's, it's faith and trust of God. I trust you. I believe. I trust you. First is always an expression of faith and trust. God always demands first place in your life. And by nature of his transcendent and holy nature, will never settle for second place. If he did, he wouldn't be God. He'll always demand first place in our lives. He'll never settle for second. Luke 9, 59, Jesus talks about this. He said to another, follow me, implying priority. But the guy said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go. I got another priority. I'll follow you, but let me take care of this first and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That even though this guy had made a commitment to follow the Lord, he put something else ahead of following the Lord. And Jesus says, you're not fit. That the moment you deprioritize seeking first the things of God, the kingdom of God, the Lord, his righteousness, he said, you are disqualified for the, from the kingdom in its totality. Not because the guy didn't have an intent to follow. He got the order wrong. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. Come on, this is, this is a big deal for us, for us moving forward in the things of God. Whatever you make first in your life will dominate the remainder of your life. Whatever you make first in your life will dominate the remainder of your life. Again, sequence matters. Whatever you prioritize will define everything else that comes after that. Sequence matters. Just try icing the cake before you put the thing in the oven and see how that works out. <laughs> Sequence matters. Whatever, however you do things first, it determines what comes after that. First things first. So I'm gonna give you, give you a few things here. Very, very important concerning our lives. Concerning first things first. Number one is this, becoming God's firstborn. Becoming God's firstborn. I said, I think, Last week or so, there's two kinds of people in the world, people that need to know the Lord and people that need to know the Lord better. Amen. Only two kinds of people. You could also say that there are people in the world who need to be born again and people who need to be born again, again. <laughs> Come on, this, is, this is a big deal talking about God's firstborn. People who need to be born again or people who need to be born again Again, listen, listen at this. We, we, we talk, listen at the language. You know, I've been walking with God for 25 years. Some of us, like me, have been walking with the Lord. I've been walking with God for 25 years. Maybe that's the problem. Because instead of walking with God, by now maybe you should be running with God. <laughs> or, or instead of running with God, maybe you should be flying with God. Pace matters. Pace matters. And so when I, when I talk about being born again, again, we're, we're talking about an acceleration. We're talking about traction and moving forward, not just working with God. Paradigm, not just faith. Paradigm matters. And there's something that the Bible calls firstborn status that we're going to see here from the word of God. It's one of the first things first that we need to address in our lives, in our lives for this new year. In, in biblical culture, listen to this, in biblical culture, special privileges were bestowed on the firstborn male child. He received a double portion of the inheritance, 
the paternal blessing and held special favorite status in the family and in life. That's the distinction of what you see the firstborn in scriptures. Now, if you're not the firstborn male, don't sweat it. Because God doesn't discriminate. He's no respecter of persons. And I'm going to show you from the word of God that you don't just have to be the firstborn biological son. God has made provision for you to, to gain firstborn status through faith in Jesus Christ. And so what that means that, again, a double portion of the inheritance, the paternal blessing and special favorite status in the family and in life is the blessing of the firstborn. Are you with me? Very important. Let's go a little bit deeper here. Genesis chapter 49, verse 3. Listen to Jacob talk about the significance of the firstborn. Genesis 49, 3. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. You're my firstborn. Now, after Passover... In Exodus chapter 12, look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast. God says, It is mine. That God lays claim and ownership to the firstborn. Very important. That God says the firstborn is mine. Take a look at this. Through faith in God's firstborn, who is Jesus Christ, all Christ's followers obtain firstborn status, rights, and privileges through faith in him. All believers obtain firstborn status before God, who says the firstborn is mine through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. God says in, in Deuteronomy 32 or so, he talks about how the, the, the people, the Lord's portion is his people. And they have, he has encircled them and he, he has uh, kept them as the apple of his eye. He talks about Israel, his people always being his firstborn. Exodus 4:22, as a matter of fact, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. I'm taking time to deal with this because this is a big, big, big deal to God. And it's not been taught on a whole lot concerning your firstborn status in the eyes of God and who God has called you to be and what you're entitled to receive through faith in Jesus Christ because of your status, not because of what you've done, because of what he has done. And I'm telling you where the world is now this year, we're going to need to know that we're the firstborn. Because whatever we do first, I'm telling you, it's going to define and dominate everything that comes after from this, this, this point forward. So he says, Israel is my firstborn. Where, where, did, where did Israel, God's firstborn, originate? Take a look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 9. So then those who are of faith. Are you of faith? Yes. Any people of faith here this morning? Yes. Come on. So Israel is God's firstborn. Where did Israel come from? Galatians 3, 9 says, so then, then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Chapter 4, verse 28 says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Amen. You're the child of promise. Amen. We've achieved firstborn status through faith in Jesus Christ. You know what? If you've ever been looked over, skipped over, or messed over, don't sweat it. God is in the business of bringing people into firstborn status. Take, take a look at this. Food for thought. He chose Abel over Cain. Yeah. Abel was a younger brother. He chose Isaac over Ishmael. Isaac was a younger brother. Not, not biologically firstborn. We're talking about faith. We're talking about the favor of God. We're talking about the blessing of God. He chose Abel over Cain. Isaac over Ishmael, he took Jacob over Esau, Rachel over Leah, who was the older sister. He took Joseph over his older brothers. He took Ephraim, who was a younger brother, and took him over Manasseh. 
Come on, he took David, who wasn't even invited, and exalted him above his brothers. The prodigal son was a younger brother. I'm telling you, God is in the business of finding people whose hearts are right and elevating those people up into firstborn status. It's why Jesus says those who are last are going to be first. Oh, this is something that's dear to the heart of God, that through faith in Jesus Christ, he wants to bring you into Firstborn status. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Galatians 6 15 for in Christ Jesus. Everybody say in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Remember, Jesus is the first, right? For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and the mercy and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Be upon the Israel of God. You study through Exodus chapter 12 again that, that, that God called for the firstborn to be destroyed as a judgment on the Egyptians. But God tells his people, when I see the blood, when I see the blood applied to your doorpost, applied to your home, applied to your family, all the firstborn of Egypt were destroyed. But God then blesses and sanctifies the firstborn through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, we've been sanctified by the blood, and we're speaking and declaring over this church, over every family, every, every individual represented in this church, we speak the blood of Jesus over you and your family that brings you into firstborn status. It's the blood of Jesus. That the curse is not going to come this way. Destruction is not going to come this way because God says, when I see the blood, I consecrate the firstborn through the blood of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise the name of the Lord. This is all throughout the scriptures in terms of Jesus making us to be one with him. One more scripture here from Romans chapter one, Revelation chapter one, verse five. It says, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You see it all throughout the scriptures that he's brought us into firstborn status. This is why Paul writes in Romans 8, he says we are heirs with God and we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We share the firstborn status with him. Somebody say amen. amen. This is the first things first is us becoming God's firstborn. Number two, I told you I got a lot to unload here. Number two is returning to our first love. Not just becoming God's firstborn again through faith in Christ, but returning to our first love. Luke chapter 10 verse 27, we know this, so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this big deal, and you will live. Loving God with everything that we are and loving our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus says, do this, and you will live. Love for God and equal intensity in terms of love for God's people. He says, you will live, returning to our first love. Look at Psalm 91, verse, verse 14. We know this. God says this, because he has set his love upon me, because he has set his love upon me, look at all the benefits. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call unto me, God says, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and will show him my salvation. Why? Because he set his love upon me. Because he set his love upon me. Returning to our first love. This first day of the new year, I am encouraging and challenging you and exhorting you to return to your first love for Jesus and for his word. Can you say amen? amen. We see that in Revelation chapter 2. He speaks to the church of Ephesus. He tells them this, nevertheless, this is the thing I have against you, 
that you have left your first love. You left your first love. They kind of became, you know, works based church. It's kind of what we call going through the motions, just kind of doing it because that's what we do. And Jesus says, I'm looking at your heart. This is the thing I have against you. You've left your first love. Come back to your first love. Don't just come to church because it's Sunday. Don't just come because this is what we do. Don't just come out of habit. Don't just come out of tradition. I come every single Sunday, Lord, rekindle a deeper love and a passion in my heart for you. This is the time that God is calling us to return to our first love. Interesting verse from Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1, New Living Translation. The Lord gave me another message. He said, go and shout this message to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago, how you loved me and followed me even through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his children. All who harmed his people were declared guilty and disaster fell on them. I, the Lord, have spoken. God says, I remember back when, when you were passionately in love with me. He says, I remember how you followed me even through the barren wilderness and the love times and the tough times. And when you did, he says, anytime an enemy came against you, I made sure that disaster came on him because of because of your love for me. You want God to deal with your enemies this year? You want to see God bring disaster on your enemies? Rekindle your love for God. Rekindle your passion for the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. So we talked about. Becoming God's firstborn, we talked about returning to our first love. Here's the third one, honoring God with the first fruits. Honoring God with the first fruits. These principles are all throughout the scriptures. Leviticus 23, 9 says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. In other words, God says, when I bless and prosper you and I bring you into the land, God says, always remember to bring the first fruits back to the house of God to honor the Lord for what he's done. First fruits is an expression of thanksgiving to God to commemorate coming out of Egypt to commemorate God's deliverance from bondage and also taking possession of the promised land. You see it all throughout the scriptures in terms of God taking the first portion, the best portion. We see it in the word. The difference between law and grace, listen at this. Tithing is a form of first fruits. The difference between law and grace is simply this, obligation versus opportunity. People argue all the time, law and grace, real simple. There's a difference between law and grace, obligation versus opportunity. Under the law, they were obligated to do what we under grace have the opportunity to do. Real simple. Opportunity versus obligation. First fruits offerings guarantee a greater harvest to come. First fruit offerings always guarantee a greater harvest to come. Remember the prophet telling the widow woman? Make me a cake first. What happened to her life after that? There was perpetual abundance in her life because she understood the principle of first fruits, not as an obligation, but as an opportunity. Exodus 23, 19, the first of the first fruits of your land, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk the first of the first fruits, always a picture of bringing God's best to him to declare that he is first. Two more passages, Romans chapter 11, verse 16. Paul writes this, he says, for if the first fruit is holy, he says, then the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. That whenever you sanctify the first part, the first fruits, the first fruit is holy. It makes the entire lump holy. Whenever you make the root holy, 
It makes all the branches holy. I want to encourage you in your own life to continue to honor the principles of first fruits so that God will honor everything else that comes in your life to honor the Lord with the first fruits. We see that in Proverbs chapter 3. Look at this. The first fruits offering ensures that God will bless the rest. The first fruit offerings ensures that God will bless the rest, whatever comes after it. Look at Proverbs 3, 9. We know this one. Very clear. Everybody say, honor the Lord. Honor the Lord. Just tells us, honor the Lord. Always an opportunity, never an obligation. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Remember I said that make sure that the rest is blessed. Look at verse 10. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. On this first day of a new week and the first day of a new month and the first day of a new year, God is first. Make Jesus first. Become the firstborn. Embrace the firstborn status that God has afforded us through faith in Jesus Christ. Return to your first love and honor the Lord with your first fruits. And I'm telling you a word from the Lord. You do that and watch God rock your 2023. You watch God rock this year for you. You watch him. You watch him. You watch him. We agree in the name of Jesus. It's going to be an extraordinary year. It's the year of Jubilee. It's the acceptable year of the Lord to the glory of God in Jesus' name. You get anything out of the word of God this morning? Come on, we put him, we put him first in everything that we do. Well, friends, all I can say is, wow. When I listen to this teaching, when I uh, think about these principles and meditate on the principles that I've just shared in this teaching, friends, they are revolutionary, friends. I'm telling you, if you lock in, if you get dialed in to what you just heard, you will see a breakthrough year in your life, friends. Knowing what it means to be God's firstborn status through faith in Jesus Christ, friends, that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. If you know that, if you believe it and receive it and stand on it, friends, you're going to see God's purposes uh, shine through and come through in your life, friends, in ways that you haven't seen before. If you return to your first love, coming back to the place when Jesus meant the most to you and you recognize the joy of salvation and being free from sin, being redeemed from sin and condemnation, friends, and knowing the joy and the goodness of God and being in right relationship with Christ. Go back to your first love. And I want to honor you to always sow your seed and give your first fruits. As God prospers, prospers you and blesses you as he did his people in the scriptures, friends, always bring the first part and the best part back to honor God and God will always honor you. Firstborn, first love, first fruits, first things, first friends. What an amazing teaching. Listen to this over and over and over again. I want to encourage you because faith comes by hearing, not because you heard and share this teaching with as many people as you possibly can. I know it's going to be a tremendous blessing to them as well. Before you go, if you missed the opportunity before to invest and to sow, talk about first fruits. This is a great time at the beginning of the year to honor the Lord and to also bring our tithe and our offerings. Friends, scan the QR code, jump on your church app right now to give. Uh, go ahead and uh, text to the number you see there or visit our website to sow and invest and the mission and the vision of Insight Church. Don't forget, tomorrow, 24-7 prayer and fasting starts this week. We hope you're going to be engaged. It's going to be life-changing as well. Before we go, I just want to speak God's blessing over you, if I may, by simply saying to you, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, friends, and give you his peace in Jesus' name. Always remember, Jesus loves you. Pastor Sharon and I love you. Be well. Be encouraged. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand 
When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I